how nice that we can all be together today in, in person. Um, thank you all for coming. Um, it is my honor um, today to introduce um, our seminar speaker, um, Dr. Melinda Angevic, um, or I think a lot of people in this room might know her as Micro Mindy um, <laughs> on the Twitterverse. Um, Dr. Engevik is Assistant Professor of Regenerative Medicine at the Medical University of South Carolina in Charleston, just, you know, down the way from here. Um, Dr. Engevik is an extremely productive scholar, um, as evident in her being named the 2024 Cotron Early Career Investigator Award from the American Society for Investigative Pathology. Congratulations. <laughs> um, this is just one among um, her 58 other awards on her CV, um, including the 2021 award um, from the Crohn's and Colitis Foundation as a young investigator. Wow. Um, Dr. Engevik has published 59 papers and has over 100 meeting abstracts at local, national, and international meetings. So um, I think you probably have that, um, that platinum travel card at this point, right? I wish. Yeah. <laughs> um, so Dr. Engevik's lab inter interrogates the crosstalk occurring between intestinal bacteria and the GI um, epithelium with a particular focus on a topic of interest to many of us in this room, and that's mucus. Mm. Um, everybody, please join me in extending a very warm welcome to Micro Mindy. Oh. We're so happy to have you here today. Um, thank you so much, Audra. That's such a kind introduction. <laughs> You really touted too many phrases, yeah. but I um, appreciate you guys all taking, um, letting me come here today. It's super exciting to be just a little bit north of South Carolina <laughs> and to talk to you guys today about some exciting bacterial bacterial interactions that we're looking at in our lab. And so, obviously, our gut, our my, <laughs> our lab is interested in the gut microbiota, and everybody in this room knows a lot about the gut microbiota. But you know, just as a reminder, it's obviously a complex and dynamic community of microorganisms, and these bacteria of um, the Bacteria are really the best characterized members of the gut microbiome, and it's been estimated that there are approximately 10 to the 11th to 10 to the 12th bacterial cells per gram of feces. So there's a lot of bacteria, and these bacteria do a lot of things for us. They can secrete enzymes that can degrade indigestible um, substrate, substrates that are not accessible to the host under normal conditions. They can produce anti-inflammatory compounds like amylbutamyl cysteine that can suppress pro-inflammatory cytokines. They can beneficially modulate the immune system and educate the immune system. They can produce molecules like short-chain fatty acids, which are, of course are an important fuel source for the gut cells. And importantly, they're very good at excluding pathobionts and pathogens that can be really detrimental microorganisms. And all of these things, of course, contribute to overall gut health. Now, multiple groups have really demonstrated that the healthy human gut microbiome really consists of Firmicutes, which are seen in purple here, and Bacteroidetes, which are seen in yellow. Or if you guys are crazy about the new nomenclature, now they've been recently renamed to Bacillioita and Bacteroita, so whatever you prefer. Um, and then of course you have lesser amounts of Proteobacteria, Fusobacteria, Actinobacteria, and Microbia. But in the setting of disease, there tends to be a shift in this gut microbiome composition. You tend to get a reduction of these Firmicutes and Bacteroidetes, and an expansion of uh, bacteria such as Proteobacteria and um, Fusobacteria. And um, these can occur in a number of different diseases, such as diabetes, obesity, and one that we're really particularly interested in, which is inflammatory bowel disease. So inflammatory bowel disease is a group of chronic inflammatory conditions of the intestine. And unfortunately, the incidence of IBD has been rising in recent years, and there are estimated 5 million people that live with IBD globally. And of course, as the name implies, inflammation, of which occurs in IBD, happens when epithelial cells or immune cells secrete cytokines, um, which then can interact with other cell types. And in the case of aberrant inflammation, they can ultimately cause tissue damage, neuronal activation, and pain. And so there's two different subsets of IBD. There's Crohn's disease and ulcerative colitis. So in Crohn's disease, you really have this mix of healthy intestine and disease intestine. It can occur both in the small and the large intestine, and it's well characterized by the presence of creeping fat. In contrast, in ulcerative colitis, you actually just have a continuous inflammation that occurs only in the colon. And these patients commonly have ulcerations and a lot of bloody stool. 
And of course, you can also appreciate the severity of this disease when you look at these endoscopic images. So on the left-hand side, you can see a healthy gut. It's smooth and glossy in appearance. And on the right, you can see a patient with ulcerative colitis, which has a raw and inflamed appearance. And if you were to biopsy the tissue of these guts, you would see that a healthy individual has these nice crypts that are lined with those white goblet cells that produce protective mucus. And in ulcerative colitis patients, we really see some of loss of the crypt architecture and a lot of infiltrating immune cells. So we know from our work and others that mice lacking key ion transporters have an altered gut microbiota because they have altered intestinal environment. So it's really clear that genetics ultimately influence what type of environment you have and ultimately that changes what microbes are able to colonize that area. And so in the setting of IBD, it's been well documented that patients have altered gut, um, gut transporters, particularly NAG3 and DRAW, and this results in an altered intestinal environment and ultimately an altered gut microbiota. And unfortunately, these microbes have a different function. So um, it's been shown that patients with IBD have um, changes in digestion, particularly an increased prevalence of mucin degrading microbes. There's fewer commensal microbes. There's more aberrant immune activation. They produce lower levels of short chain diastasis, particularly butyrate. And now they're no longer able to exclude pathobionts or pathogens to the same degree as a commensal gut microbiome. So we were really wondering if we could identify microbes that were present in both ulcerative colitis and Crohn's disease that would set the stage for pathogen colonization. Um, and so we were really looking to see if we could find microbes that appear to be abundant in both of these subsets. So we turned to this IBD transcriptome and metatranscriptome meta-analysis database. So a big title, I call it just IBD TAMA, but it houses 3,853 different publicly available RNA-seq data sets, which represents 26 different studies. So if we find microbes that are elevated in all of these studies, we feel pretty confident that they're microbes of interest. Um, so here you can see a plot that's generated by the IBD TAMA where microbes that are elevated in Crohn's disease are seen on the top part, and ones that are statistically significant are seen in red, and microbes that are elevated in healthy controls are seen on the bottom part of the line, and their statistically significantly elevated ones are seen in blue. So we found that Fusiobacterium, particularly Fusiobacterium nucleotum, was one of the top 10 bacteria that were elevated in Crohn's disease patients in the colon. And we also found in ulcerative colitis that um, Fusiobacterium nucleotum was also highly prevalent. Another microbe that we found that was really of interest to us was Klebsiella pneumoniae. We found that it was higher in Crohn's disease patients and really very high in ulcerative colitis patients. So we were curious, perhaps Fusiobacterium and Klebsiella could promote pathogen colonization. And the pathogen that we're interested in is Clostridium difficile or C. diff. It's a gram-positive spore-forming pathogen from the phylum Firmicutes. And according to the CDC, there's approximately 500 infections with C. diff each year. And this is associated with 29,000 deaths and $4.8 billion in excess medical care costs. And unfortunately, IBD patients have a fourfold increased risk of getting C. difficile infections. And when they do, they have far worse outcomes. They have increased rates of colectomies and complications and hospital stays. They have increased mortality. And we're thinking that their microbiome might really set the stage for this infection. So one of the reasons why C. difficile is such a prevalent pathogen is that when it gets stressed, it can form these spores. And you can see here by microscopy, a pink um, spore forming within the mother cell of a green C. diff. And these spores can then be released into the environment and last for years. And now the normal things that we do in the lab to kill off bacteria include things like ethanol, lysol, and autoclaving, but these spores are completely resistant to that. The only thing these spores are really sensitive to is 10% bleach for at least 10 minutes. But of course, bleach is corrosive, and so it's not widely used in the hospital setting. And so this can be an area where patients can um, encounter C. difficile spores. So if you were a patient and you're in the hospital or you're out in the soil and you, you encounter C. difficile spores, are you immediately going to get colonized with C. diff? And the answer is no, it's a bit more complicated than that. As a normal healthy individual, you hopefully have a lot of Firmicutes and Bacteroidetes, and um, they're um, responsible for taking these primary bile acids that are secreted by the liver and converting them into secondary bile acids. And secondary bile acids will actually inhibit vegetative C. difficile, and the gut microbiota is pretty good at excluding C. diff as well. But now in the setting of antibiotic use where you shift the microbiome, um, it's thought that over time, hopefully that microbiome will return to normal. But in this stage, if you then encounter C. difficile spores in the environment, you now have a large pool of primary bile acids that C. difficile spores can use to germinate and become a vegetative C. difficile. C. difficile is then able to colonize the colon. It can produce these toxins, which really cause the hallmark of C. diff infection, which include unremitting diarrhea, inflammation, and a potentially life-threatening toxic megacolon. Now, if you're a patient and you come to the physician and they diagnose you with C. diff infection, the first thing they do is they give you antibiotics. 
But unfortunately, obviously, antibiotics were the issue in the first place. So for some patients that are going for treatment of C. diff, they'll relapse. They'll get um, colonized again with C. diff. And this can actually occur over multiple cycles. And this is really where fecal microbiota transplant has stepped in by restoring the normal gut microbiome that can help out compete C. diff, remove that primary bile acid pool. But it's not an FDA-approved drug, and there are a number of adverse events. So we're really interested in identifying early on what's happening in C. difficile infection. And like I said, IBD patients have already a susceptible microbiome at baseline. In fact, it's estimated that 40% of IBD patients can get C. difficile infection without even being on antibiotics. So we really reason that these microbiome interactions in the IBD gut might be one of the reasons why these patients have worse outcomes. So we hypothesize that similar to other enteric pathogens, that C. difficile could bind to the intestinal mucus layer, which in the human and in the mouse is dominated by the mucus of protein mark 2. And then in this mucus layer, we predicted that it'd be interacting with other microbes. And the first one that we were really interested in was looking at the interaction with Fusobacterium mucoglottum. So first we wanted to confirm that C. difficile could actually bind to mucus. So we fluorescently tagged our C. diff and looked at its adhesion to mock or mucus coat cover slips. And you can see that in a mock PBS coated cover slip here, you have a little bit of your fluorescently tagged green C. diff, but not a lot. But we see robust adhesion of C. difficile when we add mucus that we isolated from human colonic cell lines, LS147 or H29 TX cells, or if we isolate stool mucus from healthy individuals, we can see that we have a lot of C. difficile binding to that mucus. And you can see that even better by looking at scanning electron microscopy where you see a higher magnification where C. difficile is really bound to that intestinal mucus, which is seen in purple. Now, C. difficile strains can be classified into subgroups by, uh, based on their PCR ribotyping, and different subgroups are more common to cause infection than others. And you can see in this bar graph that the, strain, um, the ribotypes 078, 027, and 001 are the most common strains that cause infection. Um, and the strain that I just showed you data for, C. difficile R2291, was an O27 strain. So we wanted to know, do all C. difficile ribotypes actually bind to mucus, or is this something that's unique to this individual ribotype? So what we did is, once again, we fluorescently tagged C. difficile strains and added them to 96 little um, plates that were coated in mucus. And you can see that here we have 11 different C. difficile strains representing six different ribotypes. And you can appreciate that we had adhesion of all of these strains to intestinal mucus, Although interestingly, we did see some strains that were able to adhere better to mucus than others. But regardless, we do see that this is a conserved feature amongst C. difficile strains. We also wanted to confirm this using cell lines. So we used our human mucus producing goblet cell cell lines, LS147. And after one hour of um, in interaction with our fluorescent tag C. diff, and after staining for the human mucus mucin protein MUC2, we see this nice co localization between C. diff and green and MUC2 and purple. And you can see that even better, of course, with this higher magnification by um, scanning electron microscopy. And then, of course, to go one step further, we wanted to use the organoid model, which is a really powerful way to really assess um, bacterial host interactions in a more physiologically relevant model. So we isolated crypts from healthy individuals. So you can see a crypt here by light microscopy. We grow them up in three dimensions with all the stem cell factors. Um, and they obviously form these nice three-dimensional structures that importantly have all of the cell types that are found in the gut, including MUC2 positive mucus producing cells. We can then take those 3D organoids and um, make trans wells or monolayers. And once again, we see importantly, they have our mucus producing cell lines. So using this system, we found that after adding our C. difficile for one hour, that we have this really nice co-localization between fluorescent tag C. diff and green, and our much too positive mucus producing goblet cells in purple. So then we saw that C. diff was able to bind to mucus. What about Fusiobacterium? So um, we did the same procedure where we fluorescent tagged Fusiobacterium and looked at its adhesion to mucus coated cover slips. And in this case, Fusiobacterium nucleatum has several subspecies. So we looked at Fusiobacterium nucleatum subspecies nucleatum. Fusiobacterium mucilatum subspecies polymorphum, and Fusiobacterium mucilatum subspecies animalis. And that is a, hand, a mouthful to say. And similar to our C. diff strains, we found that um, we had some differences in mucus adhesion based on the strain. Polymorphum was much better at binding to mucus than our other strains. But regardless, we still had a lot of adhesion. And you can actually see that here by microscopy as well, where you see a lot of the purple, pink colored Fusiobacterium binding to the muck two in yellow. So then we wanted to find out what other microbes are there, and if there are other microbes and other cell types present, will C. difficile be present with Fusiobacterium? So what we did is we did bioreactors where we seeded them with the stool from three donors that we pooled together. We allowed them to establish a community, and then we treated this um, bioreactors with clindamycin, which is one of the antibiotics that is common for resulting in C. difficile infection in the clinic. This then altered the gut microbiome, and then we added our bacteria C. difficile R2291. 
And in this case, we modified it by actually doing this hanging insert where we added mucus coated cover slips. So this is a flow system. So in this system, C. diff has to sense that there's mucus, swim to the mucus, bind, and then form a community with other members that are present in this gut microbiome. And then we then monitored what was on that um, mucus coated cover slip by looking at the bacteria and then looking at um, biofilm production. So just first we did um, fish stainings with a probe specific for C. diff seal in red and then a universal bacterial probe, 16S, um, in, in blue. And you can see that we do see C. difficile present in aggregates in these, um, in these mucus-coated cover slips in the bioreactors. And we did 16S sequencing. We actually found that C. difficile was able to bind to mucus-coated cover slips if they were coated in mucus, but were not able to bind to the mock PBS-coated cover slips. And then we looked at biofilm production by using a ruby red biofilm tracer and using crystal violet, both of which stain the extracellular matrix. And we can see that these communities are really forming an active biofilm. And then when we did um, further um, analysis of our 16S sequencing, we found that actually Fusiobacterium was one of the dominant members um, that were colonizing this intestinal mucus layer. And interestingly, when we did 16S of the culture itself, there was very little Fusiobacterium in the liquid culture, but clearly it seems to be thriving within these mucus um, coated cover slips. And we also identified um, within Enterobacteriaceae Clebsiella. So first we just wanted to confirm that C. difficile could grow well with Fusiobacterium species. So we took a monoculture of C. difficile in, um, in green and a monoculture of Ethnopulatum polymorphum in pink, and then a co-culture. And we actually found that they had the similar growth curves and the nice thing is that these bugs are, look very different under the microscope. So you can actually just look by light microscopy and see these long spindly fusiobacterium and these short rods of C. diff. And they actually have about a 50-50% distribution between the two. And then we went to the literature to see, is there a lot, is there's not a lot known about fusiobacterium, but what is out there that could indicate that C. difficile and fusiobacterium might have an interaction? We found this paper by Caparthy in 2007 where they actually looked at the genome of Fus uh, fusiobacterium nucleotum polymorphum. And they actually found that there were 16 conserved gene clusters that were from C. diff within Fusiobacterium mucilatum. These included five composite ribotypes and transposons that are very similar to C. difficile CDL, ST, isotrons. So this kind of suggests that somewhere in the past, C. difficile and Fusiobacterium have acted together synergistically. So then next, we wanted to see if uh, Ethnopulatum metabolites could influence C. difficile. So just as a control, we grew up C. diff in a fully defined minimal media. We then transferred its metabolites to a new active growing culture of C. difficile. And we did the same thing with Fusiobacterium mucilatum polymorphum. We grew it, we took its metabolites and added it to a fresh growing culture of C. difficile. And after nine hours, we looked at uh, by RNA-seq at what was changing. And we found that the presence of Fusiobacterium mucilatum Nucleotide metabolites actually upregulated 286 different genes in C. difficile. And some of the ones that struck us as being particularly notable were we had a large increase in cell wall components and C. diff in response to F. nucleotide metabolites, as well as a lot of efflux transporters that are known to be involved in antimicrobial resistance. Now, Fusiobacterium is well known in the oral cavity for being this multi-species forming biofilm member. Um, and beautiful staining by Wendy Garrett's group showed that Fusiobacterium, which is seen here in yellow by fish staining, is really an integral member of these biofilms in the oral cavity. And then work by Cynthia Sears has also shown that F. nucleotum is really prevalent in biofilms in colorectal cancer. Here, um, Fusiobacterium is seen in blue with other members of the gut microbiome and other colors. So the classic model of biofilm formation is you have bacteria that bind to a substrate that they prefer, they bind to other bacteria and they aggregate, and then they start secreting extracellular matrix, which is DNA, protein, um, and polysaccharide. And so we were first interested in this first step, this, um, we know that it adheres to mucus, but does it aggregate and um, interact with fusiobacterium? So to do this, we fluorescently tag C. difficile in green and fusiobacterium in red, and we added these bacteria together in an aggregation buffer. And then we looked by microscopy to see if they co-localized. And you can see here that C. diff in green and Fusiobacterium nucleotum in red have a really close aggregation when they're grown together, I mean, just put together for one hour in this aggregation buffer. And I always love a good um, assay that is easy to see by eye. You can even just look by light microscopy and see these aggregates of stringy Fusiobacterium and these little short rods of C. difficile. And the oral cavity people have done an excellent job of figuring out these aggregation assays. So there's a very simple way that you can test this. You can add, um, a bacteria of interest, C. difficile has flagella, so we wouldn't expect it to really aggregate much on its own. Fusiobacterium nucleotum has been shown to auto-aggregate, so we'll bind to each other. The bacteria will get so heavy and they'll fall down to the bottom of these cubettes. And then in theory, if your bacteria bind together, they should make aggregates that are heavy and they just fall to the bottom of the solution. And then you can measure the optical density and calculate the amount of aggregation that occurs. 
So um, using this calculation, we can see that C diff by itself doesn't auto aggregate very much. Uh, P pseudobacterium eglatum by itself aggregates a lot. And then when we do the co-culture of the two, we can see um, a substantial increase in aggregation. And I just always love seeing something so easy in the lab. You can see in these cuvettes that our uh, P pseudobacterium and C diff cultures have completely fallen to the bottom of those cuvettes because they've been aggregating together. Now, in the oral cavity, it's been shown that Fusibacterium nucleotum binds to bacteria using two major adhesins. You have FAT2, which has been shown to bind to gram-negative bacteria like polymorphous, um, polymorphum, uh, wow, Corpomonas gingivalis, um, or it can bind to um, gram-positive bacteria like Streptococcus using RAD-D. And they've gone on to show that you can actually block these using simple compounds. You can add galactose, and it will block FAT2 and prevent the binding to P. gingivalis, or you can add arginine, and that will block red D and prevent the binding to streptococcus. And then, of course, as a neutral control, you can add glucose, which shouldn't do anything. So we did this very simple assay. We obviously see that we have, um, when C. diff and fusibacterium are together, which is in green, they have um, nice aggregation. When we add neutral buffer glucose, we don't see any change in that aggregation. When we add galactose and block FAT2, we still see that um, epineculatum has lower auto-aggregation, but in general, that um, co-aggregation of C. difficile is still there. And then we add arginine and block RAD-D, we completely lose the ability of C. difficile and fusibacterium to interact. Um, so then we also went a step further, we wanted to use genetically modified bacteria to confirm this, and we obtained mutants from Dr. Ronald Lux at UCLA. And so first, just by microscopy, you can see our wild-type fusibacterium epiculatum um, has a nice co-aggregation of C. diff. Our FAT2 mutant still maintains that aggregation, but our RAD-D mutant was completely unable to aggregate with C. diff. And then, of course, I always like a good visual. Once again, you can see in these cubets that our wild type and our FAT2 mutant were able to aggregate, but our RAD-D mutant was not able to aggregate. And then we wanted to know, all right, <clears throat> all C. difficile strains aggregate with fusobacterium. So we went back to our 11 strains of C. difficile representing six different ribotypes. And you can see that across the board, all of our C. diff strains um, have aggregation with wild type epiculatum, and it, that is lost when you add the RAD-D mutant. We also wanted to look at other subspecies of fusobacterium. So we looked at fusobacterium nucleotum polymorphum, and you can see that all of our C. diff strains aggregated with F. nucleotum polymorphum, and all of our strains aggregated, although to a slightly lesser degree, with fusobacterium nucleotum animalis. So, I mean, our data clearly shows that C. difficile is binding to the RAD-D protein of F. nucleotum, but the question is, what part of C. diff is responsible for this binding to RAD-D? Um, so we were interested in flagella because C. difficile is covered in flagella, and that's really important for adhesion to other components. So we thought maybe the flagella is binding to the RAD-D. So um, we did a, an, a, we repeated our assay where we add, you know, C. diff by itself doesn't aggregate, UC bacterium by itself does aggregate, you add the two together, you get more aggregation. And then we actually just sheared off and stripped the flagella and added it to UC bacterium. Um, and we actually saw pretty similar levels of uh, like aggregation. And when we used our denuded bacteria that we confirmed by microscopy it was devoid of flagella, we actually found that we lost that effect. Um, so we think that the flagella is really responsible on C. diff for this adhesion to fusibacterium nucleotum's red D. And then, of course, people are always interested, well, does C. difficile aggregate with other members of the gut microbiome? Is this something that's unique to fusibacterium? So we looked at a bunch of bacteria. We looked at Acromanzi mucinophila, Bacteroides acromanzimusinophila, Bacteroides avatis, Bacteroides uniformis, Rupinococcus furcus, Bifidobacterium tension, Lactobacillus brevi, E. coli, Staph aureus, Prepatilla copri, and it doesn't, it doesn't aggregate with any of these bacteria. So we do think that this is something that's a little bit more um, interesting between fusibacterium and C. diff. So our data indicates that C. diff and fusibacterium can bind to each other and they can bind to mucus when they're separately. So we wanted to know if it, you add it to mucus, will they bind separately or will they bind together in the mucus layer? So we fluorescently tagged our C. difficile and our fusibacterium and added it just for one hour to um, our mucus producing cell lines and then to human colonic organoids. And you can see just after one hour that we actually have preferential aggregation of C. difficile and fusibacterium to, the, to each other within the mucus layer on these cells. Um, you can see that like at a higher magnification, you see those nice long stringy fusio in red and this short little C. difficile rods in green. We also saw the same thing when we did um, our colonoids. We found that we had this nice cold aggregation between C. difficile and fusibacterium. So it su suggests that they actually prefer to bind to each other within the mucus layer. So obviously we've looked at the first step of biofilm formation. Now the next question was, are we actually getting biofilm? 
So for these experiments, we looked at C. difficile uh, binding to mucus and uh, producing biofilms, F. mutilatum by itself, the combination of the wild type of F. mutilatum, and then our rad D mutant. And after three days, we assessed biofilm by ruby red biofilm tracer and crystal violet staining. And you can see here the ruby red biofilm tracer. C. difficile forms a nice little lawn of biofilm. It's not an amazing biofilm producer. But when we add wild type Fusibacterium mucilata, you can actually see this kind of mountainous um, biofilm that's forming in the, in the, uh, with both of these guys. And when we add a rad D mutant, we really lose that three dimensional biofilm mm. production. We also looked by scanning electron microscopy. Once again, you can see C. difficile forming a moderate biofilm, Fusibacterium forming a moderate biofilm on themselves. But when we added them together, we actually saw three dimensional structures of biofilms. They were actually rather thick. And importantly, when we look closer by scanning electron microscopy, we can see that both C. difficile and Fusibacterium are present in these biofilms together. We also quantified these biofilms as well. Um, and we found that obviously, as expected, all of our C. difficile strains had increased biofilm production with wild type Fusibacterium mutilatum, had the same level with the BAT2 mutant and had decreased levels of biofilm with our RAD2 mutant. We also looked at Fusibacterium mutilatum polymorphum and animalis and also found that these subspecies of F. mutilatum enhance biofilm production. Now, biofilm is produced, produced, it's a matrix, right? It's made of proteins, DNA, and polysaccharides. So we wanted to see which of these were changed in the biofilms. So we found that at the protein level and at the DNA level, we had increased amount of these components. when We had wild type F. mucilata, but not the red D. We also looked at polysaccharides. So you can measure um, extracellular polysaccharide, insoluble extracellular polysaccharide, or intracellular polysaccharide. And we saw that the extracellular polysaccharide, which is what you would expect to find in biofilms, was elevated, but not the other ones. Now, biofilms are really of interest because they can infer antibiotic resistance. And what you would normally do in the lab if you want to disrupt a biofilm is you can degrade the DNA by adding DNAs, you can break up that cell-cell adhesion by adding EDTA, or you can break apart the protein by adding pro um, proteinase K. So we wanted to see if these biofilms were more resistant to these treatment groups. Um, so we found that um, even when we added proteinase K, we still had more biofilm being left over in the presence of C. diff and F. mucilatum. Same thing is true for DNAs, EDTA. And then we also added the antibiotic vancomycin, which is commonly used to treat C. diff infection. And we found that these biofilms were far more resistant to vancomycin than C. difficile biofilms by themselves. So the real question is, does this even matter in humans? Like, does it actually, does C. difficile actually interact with these bacteria in, in patients? We're able to obtain 13 surgical resections from patients that have recurrent C. difficile infection. And we did find areas within these biofilms where we did see by fish staining an interaction between C. difficile and F. mucilatum. Um, although this was only in, um, I should mention, it was only in four of the patients that we, we looked at. We also know that um, IBD patients have high fusobacterium levels at baseline. So we got some pediatric IBD patients from patients that had IBD and were positive for C. difficile infection. Um, so we took their stool samples, we did an aggregation assay, and then we did fish staining to see if we could identify C. diff and fusobacterium that are already present in these samples and see if they're aggregating. And we also were able to show co-localization. So this data indicates that C. difficile and fusobacterium can interact in patients. Um, and we would expect from our in vitro data that this might have more of an effect on inflammation. Um, so we then turned to a mouse model where we added C. diff and fusobacterium to mice and wanted to see if they had worse infection. So um, for this model, we treat our mice with a cocktail of antibiotics and then a single dose um, IP injection of clindamycin. And then we give them either C. difficile by itself, F. polymorphin by itself, or the combination of the two. And just to orient you guys, if we're not familiar at looking at mouse colon, um, the normal mouse colon has its nice secreted mucus um, produced by these goblet cells that then make it so that the luminal contents can access the host. You have a nice thin muscle layer and not a lot of immune cells um, infiltrating. So you can see that in our control and treated mice, we have a nice mucus layer um, and normal histology. Uh, we did a low dose of um, C. difficile because we didn't want to cause we didn't want our mice to die when we added fusio bacterium. So you can see that in this low dose model of C. difficile, we do have um, disruption of the crypt architecture, more immune cells, and the mucus layer is um, on top of the epithelium. Our F. mucilata mice, we actually also saw some inflammation that was occurring. We had more um, immune infiltration and less goblet cells. And then when we added C. diff and fusio bacterium to our mice, this is a tamer image of them. They had areas of ulceration, lots of immune cells disruption of crypt architecture and loss of goblet cells. Um, so we think that this data suggests that C. difficile and the mucus layer can interact with other microbes and that Fusiobacterium might be one of those microbes 
that might be forming a biofilm with C. diff and making it more antibiotic resistant um, and ultimately causing inflammation. And so the other microbe that we identified in our IBD TAMA database was Klebsiella pneumoniae. So we wanted to see, does Klebsiella pneumoniae also act with C. diff seal? And does it have any of the same mechanisms? Um, so for this uh, project, we, you, we obtained clinical isolates from patients that um, had IBD, as well as patients that had IBD and were at, had active C. difficile infection. And then we had commercially available isolates as well. So the first question is, Klebsiella is a proteobacteria. It's pretty good at outgrowing other bacteria. We wanted to see if it even could grow together. So we took cultures of C. difficile and Klebsiella and grew them together and um, examined them after 24 hours. And to be able to assess the numbers, we first started by doing flow cytometry um, because they're gram negative and gram positive bacteria. So you can see that we have nice gating with C. difficile by itself. We have a clear gating strategy with Klebsiella by itself. And when we did a co-culture, we added them in equal amounts. We see that um, at the end, after overnight incubation, they actually have about 50% Klebsiella, 50% C. diff. And just as a proof of concept, we took monocultures and mixed them right before flow cytometry and saw about the same, same levels, indicating that these bacteria can grow together. The nice thing is that you can easily see the more cell morphologies of these bacteria under the microscope as well. So you can see those nice C. difficile rods here. Our Klebsiella is short little tiny rods. And when we grow them together after overnight incubation, you can see about 50% C. diff and 50% Klebsiella pneumoniae. We also confirmed this by doing, looking at the, um, the isolated genomic DNA and looked at uh, the number of bacteria by qPCR, back calculating it to a, um, a CFU standard curve. And we see that when C. diff is there, we get a nice amount of C. diff, 10 to the ninth. And when we have Klebsiella co-cultures, we get similar levels of C. difficile infection. And the same thing is true for Klebsiella. Compared to Klebsiella alone, when we go to Klebsiella with C. diff, Klebsiella grows just fine. So this indicates that it's potential, has potential for these bacteria to be together in the gut. We also wanted to confirm that Klebsiella, like C. diff, could bind to intestinal mucus. We found that all of our strains of Klebsiella were able to adhere to intestinal mucus. So we thought, let's look at the same pattern that we looked at with Fusio. Can they like aggregate and form biofilm production? And so we did the aggregation assay and our positive control seen on the right-hand side in pink, which is um, C. difficile and Fusio bacterium. And you can see that there's a really nice aggregation, but you can appreciate that there is no change with any of the Klebsiella strains. So clearly these bacteria are not aggregating together. And so we were curious if they're binding to the mucus, are they not touching each other there as well? So we fluorescently tagged our C. diff in green and Klebsiella in purple. And after one hour, we see that when we added these microbes, they're actually spatially distributed. They seem to be forming micro niches that are separate, um, but close to each other. So then we wanted to look at biofilm. Klebsiella is well known to be a biofilm producer. But we might not expect much of a difference since we didn't see changes in aggregation, but we did the experiment anyway. We found that C. difficile by itself is not an amazing biofilm producer, but Klebsiella pneumoniae, um, our different strains, had varying levels of biofilm production. And when we added C. difficile and Klebsiella together into these biofilms, we saw absolutely no difference between Klebsiella by itself and Klebsiella with C. diff. So that was an interesting finding. So then we said, well, does Klebsiella potentially influence C. difficile function, and particularly like metabolism? So we grew our microbes together, and then we sent off our um, supernatant for a mass spec analysis. We did non-targeted mass spectrometry, and we found that our Klebsiella and C. difficile um, had, were spatially distributed on a PCOA plot, and we found a kind of intermediate phenotype with our C. diff and Klebsiella. But when we looked closer at what was changing, we actually found that we have a lot of changes in amino acids. So we had um, changes in alanine, aspartame, glutamate metabolism, cysteine, methionine metabolism, and arginine metabolism when C. difficile and Klebsiella were grown together compared to when they were grown alone. We also wanted to look at this functionally. So we took these bacteria and added them individually or together to biolog phenotypic microarrays. And I'm just showing you some, we looked at 300 different compounds, I'm just showing you a subset of ones that we thought were interesting. You can see here in terms of monosaccharides that C. difficile isn't using some of these monosaccharides amazingly. Um, Klebsiella can use some, okay, but when you grow them together, you can see in the yellow, which indicates a high, high growth of these bacteria, that they're far able to, far better able to use some of these monosaccharides like fructose, um, adnatol, um, uh, maltol, um, and particularly the disaccharides, we found that there was much able, better able to use cell bios, lactulose, mannan, pectin. So we do think that we are actually changing the ability of these microbes to utilize new dietary sources that they by themselves are not as um, ecologically fit to degrade. The other thing that we were interested in is 
been well thought that in inflammation, you have a release of blood cells and that might introduce oxygen into the gut. And of course, C. difficile is a strict anaerobe and that would inhibit its growth. Um, but we were curious if maybe Klebsiella pneumoniae could be able to quench oxygen and lower the oxygen content, thereby allowing C. difficile to be able to grow better. So um, in, um, in coordination with uh, Dr. Jessica Hartman at MUSC, she has this device called Recipher, and she's able to measure oxygen content over time. And so we added different facultative anaerobes. You can see lactobacillus acidophilus and lactobacillus johnsonii here. They really don't quench oxygen, hardly at all. When we add Streptococcus salivarius, we see a little bit of oxygen quenching, which is lost over time. But when we add a proteobacteria like Pseudomonas aeruginosa, you can see that we quickly have quenching of oxygen. And then when we add Klebsiella pneumoniae, we can see that even within 15 minutes in an oxygenated environment, um, this media becomes completely anaerobic and stays anaerobic long-term. We then also grew all of our strains of Klebsiella pneumoniae to make sure that they all had the capacity to do this and all of our isolates could quench oxygen incredibly rapidly in an oxygenated environment. Um, and so we thought maybe we can actually grow C. diff in the, pres in these, the presence of these bacteria aerobically because they're able to quench oxygen. And we found that when they were co-cultured together, we still had oxygen quenching. And um, one of the nice things is that C. difficile, when it's grown in brain heart infusion, is black and Club C. pneumonia is white. And so when we culture them aerobically, just visually, if you spin these pellets down, you actually see both presence of black and white. Um, and we also obviously looked by um, qPCR, and we found that um, C. difficile actually grew even better <laughs> than uh, its anaerobic conditions if Klebsiella was there aerobically. So this is kind of interesting to us that we can grow a strict anaerobe in an oxygenated environment, as long as we have a bacteria that can quench oxygen in, in that environment. So then of course we wanted to see how do they work in the presence of other microbes. So we did um, stool bioreactors, we allowed them to the established community, we treated them with antibiotics, and we pre-treated them with Klebsiella pneumoniae, and then we added C. difficile and wanted to look at the amount of um, bacteria that were present in these cultures. So you can see that our Klebsiella pneumonia is only found in bioreactors where we added Klebsiella pneumonia. It's not normally a member of the healthy human gut. Um, and you can see that when we had antibiotics with C. diff and Klebsiella together, we actually had a lot of Klebsiella pneumonia. And the same thing is true with C. diff. When we had C. diff and Klebsiella, we actually had a really high amount of C. difficile in these bioreactors. We also went and looked at how well these bioreactors were able to quench oxygen. So we took them straight from the anaerobic chamber, put them into our plates, and then walked down the hall <laughs> to go put them onto the recipher. And you can see that in that time, there was oxygen that was able to penetrate the bioreactors that had no antibiotics, and that over time, those microbes in that uh, bioreactor were able to quench the oxygen. In contrast, you can see that our bioreactors were treated them with antibiotics had a probably a bloom of proteobacteria and had more oxygen quenching capacity at baseline. But any of the bioreactors that had Club Ciela with or without C. diff maintained anaerobic conditions the entire time. So they were quenching oxygen before and uh, the oxygen maintained steady um, loss of oxygen the whole, the whole time. So then we also wanted to know, does C. difficile um, alter the intestine? Is it more pro-inflammatory, kind of like we see with um, Fusobacterium? So we took our organoids and we flipped them inside out to provide a simple model to be able to access the host epithelium. And we added live C. difficile and Klebsiella to these. And we did RNA-seq, just to show you just a tiny little sneak peek of the data, we found that when C. diff and Klebsiella were grown together, and this is independent of toxin production, that they were able to initiate more inflammatory responses, such as TNF, June, and this heat shock, heat shock protein. So then, of course, we wanted to confirm this in a mouse model, so we used our antibiotic treated mouse model with clindamycin, and then we added C. difficile or Klebsiella pneumoniae. Um, and our Klebsiella pneumoniae at baseline looked pretty normal. Nothing didn't actually cause a lot of inflammation. But when we added C. diff and Klebsiella together, we actually saw far worse outcomes. We had to euthanize these mice early because they started to die so quickly. Um, and then we had far worse inflammation. And when we looked at qPCR for some of these pro-inflammatory cytokines, you can see that when C. diff and Klebsiella were grown together in those purple bars, that they have higher levels of IL-8, IL-1-alpha, MCP-1, and IL-6. So we think that Klebsiella present in the mucus layer can act with C. difficile, but it's different than Fusiobacterium. It's probably secreting metabolites that allow C. difficile to, to grow and change its metabolism, and that it can also quench oxygen, and that together this might influence inflammation. So we think this is kind of interesting that we identified microbes that have different ways to interact with C. difficile. Obviously, Fusiobacterium can bind to make these robust bile films that are antibiotic resistant. Klebsiella can quench oxygen and change the ability of C. difficile to scavenge nutrient components. But we think that both of these things lead to worse outcomes in IBD patients. So 
what does this mean if you're a patient that has IBD? We think that um, we can maybe use a targeted antimicrobial approach to target Fusobacterium and Klebsiella, and that maybe we could replace it with a commensal organism that can then um, prevent these synergistic interactions and therefore prevent these worse outcomes with C. diff. And this is something that we're actively exploring and really excited about. And so with that, I'd like to thank you guys all for listening. Um, Taylor Tyser was the major driver. She's a grad student in my lab of this work, and I would be happy to take any questions. Uh, yeah, what do you think? That was a great talk. Um, what do you think the mechanisms are for the um, uh, resistance against like the proteases and the anti and the antibiotics from the mucus? Um, what are the mechanisms of C diff in the mucus and antibiotic resistance? Yes. Um, so I mean, like I think that C diff is still when it's bound to other bacteria like Fusobacterium, it's it's causing an increase in those efflux transporters. And that's allowing the antibiotics to not be as effective against C. difficile. And also those biofilms are thick. And in theory, if the antibiotic can't penetrate into the inner core of the biofilm, that could also, you know, you kill off the, the edge ones, but the inner, so inner core is fine so that they could then, you know, replenish and um, continue to, to do their thing. Okay. Okay. So in the shine uh, field production, normally you have a founder bacteria that is favored by specific patients. For example, in the mouth, you're gonna have, I don't know, a lot of like procedures that will produce like acid yeah. and then- so, Corey bacteria, yeah. Right, so what are the conditions that, so do you think that the uh, there are specific conditions that could be, you know, like reactive oxygen species or something like that in um, IBD patients versus normal patients that would favor both uh, Fusobacterium and CDF as, as founders in that biofilm? Yeah, so I mean, patients with an IBD tend to have higher levels of Fusobacterium mucolatum, and that means that it is permissive, right? Like that those IBD microbiomes are not excluding Fusobacterium, because normally we don't have very much Fusobacterium in our, in our gut as a normal healthy individual. And when we did mouse work, we found that if we um, gave Fusobacterium to mice, it wouldn't colonize at all. But if we wiped out the microbiome with a heavy cocktail of antibiotics first, we could get Fusio to colonize for three days. And then as soon as the microbiome got restored, it would actually kick Fusobacterium out. So I think there are something to that. You have to have the right environment for that bacteria to be able to colonize in the first place. And I think that um, altered ion transport might make a big difference because the IBD patient has less NH3, there's less draw, so there's gonna be differences in the amount of chloride, the amount of bicarbonate, and the amount of sodium, and pH, of course. And I think those things actually favor a dysbiotic um, community that doesn't functionally act the same way, and they can't exclude Fusio. So I imagine that Fusio obviously is a, the primary colonizer. It's there, and then when C. difficile enters and becomes vegetative, it then finds its, its happy partner and um, you know causes more severe infection. But I don't know exactly what it is, you know, like it'd be interesting to do, oh, actually we have done studies where we looked at pH effects on Fusobacterium and it is pH sensitive. Mm -hmm. um, so that, that might be playing a role, but we haven't looked at like modifying the composition of sodium or chloride or potassium to see, you know, what's, what is the optimal setting? But that would actually be kind of something that'd be interesting to do. Um, wonderful talk, Nadine. Um, I've got a couple of questions. Um, the first is you showed data um, suggesting that Klebsiella and Fuso binding doesn't occur so much to mucus, but is it possible that that binding might actually be increased to something like microplastics? Oh, <laughs> right. Because yeah, it's known true. that like Klebsiella and bacteria like to bind to plastics. They do, which is and, weird. Yeah. You're so, not wrong about that. Yeah, that might be an interesting thing to consider. Yeah. yeah. Are yeah. microplastics elevated in IBD? I don't know. Well, they might be maybe not in IBD, more, but in but... people, just overall in general, yeah. it seems like the yeah. amount of um, yeah. microplastics in people is seem to be <laughs> increasing. So yeah, I wonder true. if that could be one potential mechanism for like persistence. Yeah. Or, you know, I had never thought about that, but that's a totally valid point. Yeah, yeah. Um, another thing, um, and I, I am a novice to C. diff, but is there a difference in um, C. diff binding to colon in different regions of the intestine? Like you should with ethnogliatum biofilms forming in different regions of the colon. Yeah. 
So, so that's complicated. So we haven't, um, I have been trying to convince gastroenterologists to give me biopsies from patients that have our effective C. diff, but they, that's not something that they normally do. If you're, if you're found to be infected with C. diff, they don't tend to biopsy, which I guess makes sense. You know, you don't want to exacerbate um, existing inflammation and damage. So I have been really wanting to answer that question, but all I have available to me is a few surgical resections that have been, you know, given to me after these patients have had colectomies for the most part. So that's been a bit on the challenging side and I don't have different regions. They tend to be all um, uh, transverse colon. So I haven't been able to answer that question. Um, in the mouse, we don't see, we see a lot of colonization in the the, um, the mid and distal colon, not as much in the proximal colon, but um, I'd be really interested to see what that is like in humans. Yeah. Maybe, yeah. I guess, organoids, we could just yeah. grow organoids for the different regions and look at adhesion that might give us a, yeah. some insights into that. That's interesting. And then one more question. Um, are there any epidemiological data um, that might um, reveal whether C. diff is a bigger burden in people who have colon cancer? Yeah, so I mean, it is a it is a problem for patients with colorectal cancer because yeah, like they, um, so. yeah, so there is one paper actually that showed by MD Anderson, they mm -hmm. were looking at patients that had um, colorectal cancer and C. diff, and they actually found a, a ton of fusiobacterium yeah. in those patients because okay, fusiobacterium is one of the issues with colorectal cancer. And I know Cynthia, Cynthia Sears has been really interested mm -hmm. in colorectal cancer and C. diff and shown that C. diff exacerbates colorectal cancer and um, that you know, in theory, fusiobacterium is probably playing a role in that in patients. But we've had a hard time to get fusio to colonize mice long term um, for colorectal cancer studies. It's been a bit of a challenge. She's even tried germ free mice and she can't get them to colonize. So there's something maybe different too about the um, in like NACs. Yeah, the environment and adhesion in a mouse versus uh, a human. Yeah, sure, sure. Okay. Ian, do you want to unmute yourself and ask your question? Yeah, um, you know, really great presentation and, and very exciting stuff. Um, as, as someone who's a bit a bit naive uh, when it comes to IBD, I, I did hear in a talk recently about oxygenation and you know the potential trend of increased oxygenation in some of these inflammatory settings. And I was kind of wondering how you see your aggregation. Um, phenotypes you're seeing with C. diff with aerobic and anaerobic bacteria, and how do you think that that is overlaying on top of oxygenation profiles in these patients as well? Well, C, like you said, C. difficile is a, a strict anaerobe, but I right. think that if there is any facultative anaerobe from proteobacteria in particular, like it could be Pseudomonas, it could be E. coli, it could be Klebsiella, um, at least our findings suggest that those microbes are incredibly efficient at quenching oxygen. So I think that locally they make an anaerobic environment no matter where they're at. So you could be in an area of active inflammation that would be normally have oxygen, but if you have a proteobacterium member there, that area will be locally anaerobic um, within the area where C. difficile would be ad adhering and colonizing. So I think that if you have the right friends, you can live anywhere. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah. Go ahead, Joseph. Um, I don't know anything about microbes. I'm curious about when the two species are binding together. Are they just staying close to each other, like to form a biofilm? Are they like signaling to each other or pass passing metabolites? Do you know what they're actually yeah, doing? I, doing it? That's a wonderful question. It's something that I would love to know. Like, I think that like they're clearly aggregating. So that's something that they prefer to do. I think that it's a close exchange. Like you said, metabolites, they can start impacting each other's cell signaling. Um, obviously it's the start of biofilm formation. It usually takes a while for bacteria to form biofilms, but they are really quickly aggregating. So I think that that means that there's something beneficial about that aggregation. And then over time, then that can develop a biofilm. I don't know exactly what, what it is that's so special. Like why do you need to be that close? You can't be like separate. You really want to be right on top of each other. <laughs> um, but I, I don't exactly know why that is, but I think it would be interesting to do maybe like transcriptomics on bacteria that are like separate versus maybe like liquid culture before they aggregate and then what they've aggregated. Cause that would really tell you like what's what's changing in the transcriptome once once they aggregate, like what signals are being turned on. But I'd love to do that. <laughs> yeah. yeah, so this is kind of piggybacking off the beginning of Joseph's question. 
um, and I may have misunderstood the experiment, but you said that when you incubated the or co-cultured the uh, club CL with the C diff in in aero and normal oxygen, that they were fine. Yeah. So, so just fine. I it, it shocks me that they would be able to um, basically quench the oxygen that fast. Yeah. And that long you, overnight. I mean, so what I'm thinking, if you consider that maybe the, the clubs here are secreting something that's making the C diff less sensitive to the oxygen. So I would imagine they probably die from reactive oxygen species yeah. or something, right? So it's, a, it's possible. I don't um Rita, have you seen any papers where C diffacil has taken up like you know thyroidoxin or any things that would allow it to handle the reactive oxygen stress of oxygen? But that's an interesting concept. I've never yeah. thought of it in that term. But it I mean it's also possible that it yeah, has a lot of oxygen for them to yeah, and we're like growing them in five ml cultures too, yeah. and it maintains like the whole thing. Like we also did for sazerin, which is a nice oxygen indicator. It's pink if it's oxygenated, and it's just clear if it's not. We can do this, you know, just aerobically, and you can see, yeah. like, you know, it's completely clear. There's a tiny, maybe, like when we agitate it, we can see a tiny little layer of pink mm -hmm. at the very top, but it's like super subtle. And so, I mean, it's maintaining a large volume, yeah. completely anaerobic. Um, and we've done it up to 48 hours. And when the club seal starts to die off, I mean, obviously you're, you're losing some of that oxygen, oxygen quenching capacity, but it is remarkable. And I'm like, now forget the animal chamber. I'm just gonna start growing. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah. 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 Uh, yeah, I have a question. So, so you do the see the IVD patients uh, where they already have like a baseline implementation there. Yeah. So without aggregation or valve formation driven by the like the baseline implementation, like uh, cytokines or whatever things that make them aggregate, or yeah. it's the bacteria that you mentioned, like either uh, goes to or so Yeah, it's like chicken and the egg, what comes first? I, I don't know, but at least I know my mouse model, they don't have existing inflammation at baseline, and then when I add them together, they do co-localize and cause worse inflammation. But that's not to say that in the normal IBD gut, if you had existing inflammation, I would imagine that then C. difficile would be an additive on that, right? If you have PC bacterium and inflammation already, you add C. diff to that mix, it's gonna make it even worse. So I imagine that both scenarios are occurring in a patient that's not experiencing it, like inflammation, it has baseline fusio. If you were to be infected with C. difficile, it would cause a bunch of inflammation. Or if you had inflammation already and you got C. diff, you poor person. It cause more inflammation. <laughs> I'm curious about the loss of goblet cells. Um, I missed it if you said it. Like, I wonder what the timing was when you looked at that. Yeah. How quickly do they go away? And do you think it's because of the inflammation or because of the toxin? All right, I think so. Even just when we give this cocktail of antibiotics, we lose goblet cells, and I think that's an indirect effect of altering the gut microbiome. Obviously, commensal microbes secrete a lot of compounds, which feed goblet cells and uh, allow them to produce proper mucus layer. So we already have disruption of the mucus at baseline and got number of goblets, mucus positive goblet cells, just because of antibiotics. And then I do think that the inflammation is just exacerbating that loss because we know that inf inflammation does um, cause the loss of goblet cells and it suppresses mucin production. So I think it's probably a combination. Um, and obviously, the toxins cause inflammation. So I feel like that's part of that cycle. So that's it. So I'm looking for some therapeutic implications. There's some evidence that if you give people Saccharomyces, which is a yeast, after they get antibiotics, they're less likely to get C. diff. Is there something you could give people that after antibiotics that would prevent them from getting a C. diff infection? Yeah, um, we've been looking for bacteria that are able to outcompete C. diff and Fusio. It's been Okay, relatively easier to find ones that will outcompete Fusio. Klebsiella has been a bug. <laughs> it's really challenging because Klebsiella is just so well equipped to colonize. And so we haven't been able to find a lot of bacteria that are able to outcompete um, Klebsiella. So we'll, we use a chemically defined media that allows all bacteria to grow. We've added like lactobacilli and bifidobacterium. Um, but the problem is Klebsiella grows so much faster than them that they take over the cultures and then there's none of the good guys. So that has been a real struggle, but we're thinking if we could find some antimicrobial therapies that target those bugs, we could maybe get rid of them. But I do think we need to replace that niche because you don't want it open for any proteobacteria. So I think it would be valuable then to add a replacement. Maybe, you know, a fungi like Saccharomyces would be beneficial 
or like a potential probiotic, like a bifido or a lacto, or even a commensal clostridia um, or bacteroides, I think would be helpful. I know that there's a lot of groups that are looking at the defined communities, a cocktail of, you know, microbes that could then restore that niche and prevent other bacteria from um, colonizing. And I, I think that that probably is going to be the future approach. I think people are going to have to use, you know, 15 or 20 membered microbes to be able to appropriately fill that entire niche. But I, would, I think that's a million dollar question. I would love to know <laughs> what microbes are going to be the best ones to replace. There's also companies that make Firmicutes that you can give people after you Yeah, that's true. So I mean, like, I think the spore forming, you know, bacilli are a good option. Clostridium, I think, are a great option. So hopefully future stuff. Yeah. A very good talk in that game though. Uh, yeah. uh, I got I got a question about the oxygen parts also for the city yeah. that can grow with his friends together. And uh, yeah, my question is have you also tested the toxin that produced from the city? Are they also increased? Are the toxins the same? uh with the with the city that grow without oxygen really great question so oh sorry i have a lot of toxic things in here so in vitro we find that when we grow c diff and club Ciella together they produce way more toxins anaerobically and aerobically and in our bioreactors they're producing way more toxins um so like you could see by cell rounding this is a barocell assay the barocells are nice and flat you've got toxins they round up it's just a quick easy way to assess toxin production and we do live imaging so we can assess different, you know time points so we see tons of toxins by eliza and by aerosol rounding with club seal and c diff monocultures communities so we're like off and even conditioned media we can add metabolites from club seal to c diff and it will increase toxin production so we're like awesome we'll look at our mice and um yeah we had the same level of toxins in vivo which was really kind of disappointing to us but that i think indicates too that c diff seal and club seal are causing worse inflammation but it might be independent of toxin production in the in vivo setting. So at first we were like, yes, toxins in vitro. We got this, we're gonna have more toxins in the in vivo, but interesting, interesting finding. Sometimes data takes you in different areas than you anticipated. Yes, that is yeah. yeah, great talk. Thanks. <laughs> um, I was wondering if you did any of the, uh, the aggregation and attaching together uh, um, experiments with a more complex microbiota with other microbes, do, does the um, Fusa bacterium and C. diff still prefer each other? That's definitely something that we're doing right now because PC bacteria can bind to a lot of different bacteria. In theory, it could also bind to other gram negative bacteria and not you know, exclude C. difficile adhesion. So uh, we want to, I also want to do just the combo of Fusio, Club Ciela, and C. diff together and see how do they look when all of them are together. So yes, we're doing some defined communities right now where we have um, more pathobionts that are found in IBD and then more like commensal microbes that are found in like a healthy individual um, and doing those aggregation assays and looking to see like who's, who's there. So we got some fish probes and we're trying to make those beautiful Wendy Garrett images where you see all the bacteria together in aggregate. So hopefully... Hopefully soon we'll have that kind of data and we can see what the distribution is like and who likes to be close to where. Any questions? Anyone on Zoom? Here's your last chance. Okay, no pressure. <laughs> <laughs>